Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to this week's version of the Education and Helpline brought to you by the South Carolina Sea Grant Consortium, where we are here to help you navigate these next several weeks where we're starting to emerge from a quarantine and um, still doing some self distancing. But we realize that you all are still finding, trying to find ways to teach your students and also um, engage your, uh, your kids at home. And so we are bringing you this education helpline in an effort to provide you with some ideas and resources and activities that you can do very easily within the comfort of your own home. My name is Evie Bell and I'm the Marine Education Specialist with the South Carolina Sea Grant Consortium based here in Charleston, South Carolina. And I'm really excited to be talking to you all today. Um, we're going to be covering one of my favorite topics of all time um, in 30 minutes or less, which is hard for me to cut myself off uh, because I love this topic so much. But um, we're going to go over some activities related to weather and climate today. Waiting in the wings, uh, waiting for your questions is our fabulous marine educator, Kristen Gehring. She is manning the comment box. So if you join us today and have a question about what we're doing today, either the science that we're covering or the lessons that we're uh, demonstrating today, she is waiting to take your questions. And also, if you just wanna say hi, let us know where you're tuning in from. That's great, because we like to know just how many, um, how many folks are joining us today. If you're just joining us for the first time, uh, what we're gonna be doing is it's very, uh, very easy. Uh, no pressure, you can hop on, hop off as much as you'd like. These sessions are going to be archived on our Sea Grant Facebook page that you can access at any point in time. So if you happen to miss uh, today's um, today's session or if you have to leave early, that's no problem. You can access this episode as well as previous weeks on live on our Facebook page that are archived. Um, and that being said, everything that we are doing today is also going to be posted on our Sea Grant Education website. So you can download anything that we're talking about today for free. And if you have any questions, of course, we are available to help you at any point in time, not just today, with any questions that you might have. So again, if you're just joining us, this is the Thursday, uh, May 7th edition of the Education Helpline. So today we are going to be covering the third ocean literacy essential principle. Now, if you have never heard of those before, that's no problem. Um, there is a wonderful resource called the Ocean Literacy Essential Principles. And there's several, seven overarching themes that are designed to teach everyone about our connection to the ocean, no matter where you live. So you can live in the middle of the United States where you don't ever see an ocean, or you can live along the coastline. Um, these principles are designed to show you how you're connected to the ocean no matter where you live. And conversely, um, it, it, these principles are designed to show how we impact the ocean, both positively and negatively, um, showing that link between the two. So the past two, uh, if you've missed the past two and are curious about the other ocean literacy essential principles, I believe Kristen will probably post that link somewhere um, in the comment box at some point, and uh, you can check out all the other um, ocean literacy essential principles. What's also cool about that is if you are a formal educator, um, you can find out how these different um, principles align to uh, next generation science standards for grades K through 12. So if you are interested on how you can use this in your classroom, over you know, the course of the year um, or for part of the year, there are tools available to help you map that out. So, so today's Ocean Literacy Essential Principle is about weather and climate. And more specifically, the Ocean Literacy Essential Principle number three says that the ocean is a major influence on climate and weather. Now that probably sounds like a no-brainer to you, but um, it is really, really an amazing. It's really amazing when we dig down deep just how connected um, we are, how our weather patterns and climate patterns are connected to what's happening in our oceans. So um, first of all, I wanted to just talk about the terms weather and climate. Weather and climate often are interchanged. Um, you know, we'll have a really cold day during the summer, and it's the climate is you know, oh my gosh, the climate is changing. Um, 
And while these are connected, they're two totally, not totally, but they're two very different, have two very different distinct definitions. Weather is what is happening right now. So when we talk about the weather forecast, when you go home tonight and you tune into the local news, you're probably going to hear about the weather forecast for the next, for tomorrow, and even maybe a few days out. So it's more present day, what's happening right now. Climate is over the long term. What are these long term trends that we are seeing over sometimes decades, even hundreds, sometimes thousands of years? Um, it does have to do with what's happening with the weather. We look at these patterns and these trends with weather over time, but those feed into climate patterns that um, help us you know, see and predict what's happening into the future. Uh, we can also look far in the past, look millions of years ago and see what the climate patterns were um, millions of years ago. It's very fascinating. It's called paleoclimate. And you can um, investigate different ways of, you can find different ways of seeing what the trends were um, millions of years ago. It's, it's pretty fascinating stuff. So we're going to talk about weather and climate today. And the first activity that I'm going to go over, we're going to kind of roll it back to basic, basic science um, or system science for just a quick second. The first activity we're going to go over is called the carbon cycle poster. And all you need for this is the has, is a big sheet of paper, as you see right here. I've got a big, a big post-it. You don't have to have a big post-it. You can just do this on a sheet of notebook paper. Um, it's really nice to have some colored markers or colored pencils. That's great. You don't have to have that. That's fine. Um, and then um, you, there, the lesson plan itself has these pre-printed uh, arrows, okay? So what I wanted to do is just talk really quickly about carbon. Not carbon dioxide, not anything, but just the element of carbon. Because carbon is abundant and it is everywhere. There's a huge amount of carbon all, all across the globe. And carbon can be found in both your abiotics, so those non-living um, aspects of Earth, and also your biotics, so those living things, plants and animals. Carbon is everywhere. Um, but carbon doesn't like to be alone, and we're going to talk about that in just a second. So carbon is everywhere, but most of the time you're going to see carbon attached to either oxygen or hydrogen or something else like that. Um, so carbon is really, really popular. It doesn't like to be alone, so it's going to attach itself to oxygen or carbon. Oh, excuse me, oxygen, hydrogen, or another, um, another element. So what I have here on the poster is the four different spheres that we find on, uh, on Earth. So we have the atmosphere. I know it's kind of hard to read. But we have the atmosphere, which has to do with our gases and our vapors that we have on Earth. So look up. Well, that's our atmosphere, or the clouds are up there. Hydrosphere is the sphere where we find our water, our water sources. So whether it's the ocean, lakes, rivers, tributaries, creeks, even what's called the cryosphere, which is the frozen ice and the poles, this is part of your hydrosphere here. You have your lithosphere right down here at the bottom, got it circled in brown for a reason. So the, lithos the lithosphere has to do with your rocks, your sediments, your soils, those abiotic factors, non-living factors. And then you have the biosphere. Bio meaning life. So biosphere uh, is where we find our plants and our animals, everything that's living. Carbon is found in every single one of these spheres, with the most down here in the lithosphere, believe it or not, down here in the rock portion right here. But carbon actually moves. Carbon actually will move throughout these different spheres based on a type of process. So it doesn't just decide, carbon just doesn't decide to move from the lithosphere to the hydrosphere. There's an actual process that moves carbon. So I'm just going to just going to mention a couple of these processes, um, the ones that are most relevant um, to our, our conversation today. So one of the processes, and I know you might not be able to see it, but it's called the eruption of gases. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to place this arrow on our chart here to show where the carbon originates and where it ends up based on this process. So the eruption of gases, the eruption of gas, gases, the lithosphere also includes volcanoes. So when a volcano erupts, there are tons and tons of sediment and gases that are lifted up and end up into our atmosphere, including carbon, okay? So carbon can actually make its way from the lithosphere all the way up to the atmosphere because of eruption of gases. Now there are other ways, but this is a major one, how carbon can make it to the atmosphere. 
Another process is diffusion, okay? So diffusion between, let's just say, between the hydrosphere, so water and atmosphere, okay? So let's pretend we're gonna talk about the ocean. So carbon can also move from the hydrosphere to the atmosphere based on a process called diffusion. And diffusion is when something will move from a high concentration to a low concentration. So, so if there's a lot of carbon here in the hydrosphere, it can move to the atmosphere where maybe there's a little bit less concentration, okay? That's very simplistically put. Um, it can also happen the other way. So carbon can actually move from the, hydro, from the atmosphere to say the ocean um, if the concentration gets too much up here in the atmosphere, it can actually move and diffuse into the ocean here, okay? But carbon moves this way as well. Another um, process you're familiar with, and we'll end with this one, another process is the process of photosynthesis. So photosynthesis is where carbon is actually taken out of the atmosphere, the air, by the biosphere, okay? Process, photosynthesis is the process where plants take out carbon and create their own food, okay? So when they take carbon dioxide out, they make their own food, and then the byproduct is oxygen, which we need to breathe. So carbon moves. Sometimes it's quick, so photosynthesis is a little bit quicker. Um, the eruption of, of gases from a volcano, sometimes that takes hundreds of years. It doesn't happen every single day, thank goodness. Um, but this is just to show that carbon moves around the sphere. So um, when you get a, a tremendous amount of carbon up here in your atmosphere, carbon, as I mentioned before, doesn't like to be alone. Carbon will bond with something else. And for our purposes, we're going to talk about oxygen. So carbon oftentimes will bond with oxygen. And this is when you get the, the gas CO2 better known as carbon dioxide, and carbon dioxide, as um, you may or may not know, is a very, is a greenhouse gas. So the reason I talk about this is because when we impact the carbon cycle, this can also impact how much carbon potentially is getting to our atmosphere, okay, not, and not just our atmosphere, but making its way into some of these other spheres and potentially disrupting the natural process. Um, so the other part of this, this uh, activity, and it goes, and this activity goes through a lot of other processes, so respiration, weathering and erosion, so you can take it as far as you want. This activity could take you, you know, a good hour to do, um, but you want to challenge your students to figure out how carbon moves and by what process. The other piece of this that I really like is the human, the human component. Um, as part of this process, once you figure out the natural processes that move carbon around, the, um, they have cards that talk about human impact. So what happens when you, there's a lot of deforestation that goes on? What happens to the carbon then? Is it released from a certain sphere and makes its way to another sphere? Um, or you talk about the burning of fossil fuels. So there's some really great human impacts that also talk about the disruption potentially of this natural process. So what does this all have to do with weather and climate? It's pretty cool. I love carbon's pretty neat um, to see how it moves, moves through our, our earth. But when we talk about how carbon can bond when it gets up here to the atmosphere, it can bond with oxygen to create carbon dioxide. It can also bond with hydrogen to create methane. It's another uh, greenhouse gas. But what, what the problem with greenhouse gases are, and it's not really a problem, it's good that these greenhouse gases are there in some, for, in some, on some level because they do help to warm our earth. They actually act like a blanket, my trusty little towel here, um, but these greenhouse gases act and they will warm our, warm our ocean, or excuse me, warm our planet just like a blanket can do. Now, imagine if you have a lot, lots and lots of the volume of these gases, that blanket becomes thicker and thicker and thicker, making it warmer and warmer and warmer. Okay. So the problem with this is that, as Kristen talked about last week, if you missed it, Kristen talked about um, density and how um, we have density-driven currents um, that transport uh, heat and nutrients and energy all across the globe. Um, the problem when we have a lot of the impact of greenhouse gases is that 
it warms the earth, it can cause that cryosphere, those frozen parts of, of earth to melt. That fresh water will then flow down into, a, um, into the ocean or another water body, but typically the ocean, and that can cause sea level rise, okay? Another part, when you talk about um, when you talk about the warming of the planet, the actual water expands. It's called thermal expansion. The actual water expands because of the additional heat. That can also uh, contribute to um, sea level rise. Okay. So when we when we talk about um, when we talk about the impact of the melting of the ice. Kristen last week talked about the thermohaline circulation. It's a density driven current. And so when fresh water from the melting, um, melting glaciers gets into um, the salty, dense water, that can help move that current around the globe. Well, what happens if you get a lot, because a lot of warming from these greenhouse gases and that rate of fresh water starts just, in, you know, really getting into the ocean and, and at a higher concentration and a higher rate. That's going to disrupt that thermohaline circulation, that global ocean conveyor belt that is, that is transporting heat and ultimately responsible for our weather and our climate patterns. So if we disrupt that on some level, it's going to, we're going to see an impact in our, um, in our weather and climate patterns. So, um, so this is, and this all has to do with, with the movement of carbon and the concentration of carbon in a certain sphere. So um, thermal, um, thermal expansion and sea level rise, both are impacts of um, an influx of carbon and uh, the greenhouse gases. So when we talk about, and so this activity is called the carbon cycle poster and it is found, it will, it's a, an original activity by the California Academy of Sciences. You can do it again very easily. You can download the lesson plan, print out the, um, the arrows or recreate those and then have your students talk about how carbon cycles and why it's so important um, and how it impacts our climate and weather. Um, there is another activity uh, which is really great in larger groups. It's called Carbon the World Traveler. So you can do this activity and then you can actually act it out. You can um, have your group of students be carbon molecules and other students be a, the process of diffusion or photosynthesis. Um, and so students can see how carbon can move in a very kinesthetic moving, um, moving around activity. Okay. So when we talk about weather, we can't, we're gonna switch gears when we talk about weather. Um, when we talk about weather, we can't talk about weather without talking about the water cycle. Now, the water cycle is something that we, we all learn as a very, very young, um, young age about how water evaporates, condenses down, and how that can also impact um, our, our weather. And so um, when we talk about this, I wanted to show you all, I almost forgot to get this out from outside before the session started. That's why I was a little bit late, a little bit rushed. But there's this really great little activity called, um, I'm going to hold it up here, but it's called a water cycle in a bag. And you can sort of see here. So all you need is for this activity is you just need a plastic bag. You need food coloring. You don't have to do it, but food coloring is nice. And you need a permanent marker of some of some color. I chose blue. Um, and then you will need tape, uh, probably something a little bit stronger than scotch tape, but scotch tape worked well for uh, for my purposes. You can use uh, duct tape or anything like that. So what this um, I'll sit down and show you. So what this activity is designed to do is um, you can draw your draw some water down here on the bottom, um, make your ocean or your lake, draw clouds up here. And what you're going to do, you're going to seal the bag really, really good. And then you're going to you're going to tape it up to a window. And within probably about 10, 15 minutes, depending on how hot it is, you will see condensation. You can probably see just in the in the few minutes I had mine outside, you can see condensation in the bag. And then as it as it cools, it will form water droplets along the, along the side of the bag. 
So you can very easily show students or your kids the process of the water cycle of evaporation and condensation um, just, within, um, just within a bag and just within a few minutes. You can also keep this up for, for several days and uh, just see what happens over um, the course of a few days, um, noting you know, how, much, how much condensation was, was here um, if it was a really hot day, if it wasn't a very hot day, what was the difference? So you can have your students, um, you know, really make some observations and see this evaporation and condensation um, in, uh, in action. So with the evaporation of water, um, the evaporation, let me back here. The evaporation of water, um, when it gets up to the atmosphere, again, when it gets up to the atmosphere, when it cools, that's when it can come back to Earth as rain. Okay, so we uh, again we've got the the water moving through these spheres as well, um, not just carbon. So it's a very easy activity to do that shows the water cycle in a bag. Um, you can find this activity. Um, there's a link to this activity on our website. Again, very basic activities, but a really strong um, you know, science concept that you can get across uh, with your students uh, fairly easily. So if you like weather and if you like to predict the weather and follow the weather uh, every day, like I know people like myself do, um, it's there's another thing that you can do very easily just to walk outside and take your own weather, weather measurements. Um, on our website, we have a data sheet that helps you take down the daily uh, weather um, over time, you can average over time, you can see different patterns um, over the course of several several days, several weeks, however long you want to do it. Um, so you can download that. Um, you can take air temperature, uh, water temperature if you want, wind speed, wind direction, and then you can make some inferences about, um, you know, are you taking these measurements at the same time every day? Are you taking them, you know, at varied times? How did that impact the measurements that you got? Um, one of the things that we also have posted is a really great, this is a, an original activity by the Department of Natural Resources, and there are lots of versions out here. This is the one that I've used uh, before, but you can actually make your own, you can make your own rain gauge with a simple, um, you can use a mason jar um, and, a mar and a ruler, and you can mark off how much water you get during a rain event. Um, you can also use, um, you can also make your own anemometer, which measures wind speed. Um, and all you need for this activity is you need straws. You can use paper straws. If you don't want to use plastic, you can use plastic or paper straws. You can use plastic or paper. Those little Dixie cups, those little small, um, small cups. You need a pencil right here, and then you need a push pen. Okay. So what I've done here is, and you need five of those Dixie cups. So uh, what I've done here is I have put these. I've uh, punched a hole and put the straws through and taped the inside of the cups so they're facing one direction like this. Then I put a push pin at the top so that there is some there's some rotation. Okay, so I can I can spin it like this. Okay. And then I don't know if you can see, but I marked the back side of that cup, just one cup with an X. Okay. So what you have to do, what, what you want to do with this is, and this, some, this is easier with two people, um, but what you want to do is you want to go outside and have one person, if it's a really windy day, you want to go outside and have one person hold the anemometer and it should spin. You want to, it should spin, okay? So one person holds it and then the other person counts how many times in 10 seconds they see that X. So if it's not going very fat, if the wind's not blowing very hard, they're not going to see that X rotate around that many times. If, it's, if the wind is blowing really, really fast, this should spin a lot faster, and you'll see that X multiple times in a 10-second period. And then within this less, within this, um, this construction of this anemometer, there's a conversion table to where you can actually calculate the uh, miles per hour or kilometers per hour um, the, the wind was going based on how many times you saw that X in a 10 second period. So it pulls in some math skills, um, very basic, very, very basic uh, materials, 
Um, I'm sure you can substitute out if you don't have these little cups, you can substitute something else out um, for that. Um, as long as it, it's something that catches the wind, I think that's the whole the whole point of this. Um, and they're, they're all basically the same size. So you get that, you know, they're all, uh, they're all the same size. So this is a really, it's very easy to do. You can have young kids do this, go outside and take measurements on a really, really windy day and then compare it to a day that's not as windy and just see those trends over time. Um, you can also uh, make your own weather vane, um, much the same principle. You can use a pencil and um, cut out an arrow and secure it with a, um, with a push pin and then you can stick it outside and it should rotate the direction of the wind. So with very easy household supplies, you can create your own weather instruments. Um, you can also, again, access our, um, that data sheet on our, on our website um, and you can take down as many measurements as you want. And then also there are some discussion questions on that lesson uh, or excuse me, on that data sheet that talk about, um, you know, the what ifs, you know, what if, again, you were going to take this data um, at different times during the day, how might that impact? Um, what's going on? Is it sunny? Is it cloudy? What, what are some general observations? So um, you can be your own weather person and start making predictions and see how that lines up with your local, um, your local weather person. So I wanted to just end with a, um, very quickly to show you, I'm using a new camera today, so I apologize if I'm looking off into space. I'm trying to get used to it. <laughs> but um, I wanted to end with um, a, a shout out for our, uh, our quarterly magazine called Coastal Heritage. And Coastal Heritage is a free publication put out by the South Carolina Sea Grant Consortium four times a year. And each issue covers a science topic, um, ranging from um, invasive species to um, using art to convey science, to flooding here in Charleston or and across the state. Um, but we did, we've done several issues on climate change and sea level rise and the impacts that we're seeing, um, you know, ocean health related to um, changes that we're seeing with climate change and weather. Um, so I just wanted to mention a couple of these issues. You can access all of our issues online for free at any point. You can see all the topics that we've covered. But um, there are a couple of issues that um, might be of interest. This one's one of our one of our more recent ones. It's it's talking about um, the how natural systems are responding to sea level rise uh, due to some of these climate uh, climate changes. Um, so it looks at the how barrier islands and how salt marshes are adapting uh, to these um, these changes in the climate. Um, there's also another issue on extreme weather. So when we look at changes in our climate, we're seeing some differences in these extreme weather events. So sometimes we have sunny day flooding, which is uh, flooding when there's no rain. It's bright and sunny outside and we still have flooding. Um, we still have um, issues with that. So also talking about, you know, our, you know, what's happening with our hurricanes and our hurricane season. Are we seeing a difference because our seas are warming up? Um, is there is there a connection between warming seas and either the frequency um, or the intensity or both of our of our hurricanes? Um, this one as well um, is looking at shoreline change um, as a result of um, of climate change, and then um, climate change and ocean health. Just looking at how our oceans are um, adjusting or, or adapting or being impacted by. Um, by climate change, and so one of our later uh, one of our later sessions is going to actually talk about one of these impacts, which is ocean acidification. So again, looking at carbon again, and carbon um, be getting diffused more and more, and the concentration getting more and more into our oceans, and what that carbon, when it gets into our oceans in large concentrations, um, is doing to some um, to the to the chemistry of the water, and that's having a direct impact. Um, on certain organisms. So we'll talk about that in a later in a later session. So you're not done with carbon yet. Um, so and there are other issues that may be of interest to you. So I encourage you to check out Coastal Heritage on our website. Um, there is a curriculum piece that goes along with every, not every, but most of our issues. Um, all of our climate change issues have a uh, curriculum supplement 
that is aligned to state science standards available to you for free. So you can read the issue and then do the activities um, and extensions that go along with this issue that are aligned to state science standards. So um, please take advantage of this great resource. Um, it's, it's something we, we are very proud of and enjoy putting together and uh, hope that it will be of interest to you. So um, if you are just joining us at the very end, um, just wanted to say that you, this is the Education Helpline session number four, where we talked about ocean and climate and the relation to our, uh, excuse me, weather and climate in relation to our ocean. And um, we went through a few activities and demonstrations that are all available to you online. So if you have any questions, I will pause and see if there are any questions and I can um, take those now. And if not, then I will say good night and see you all. Well, Kristen will see you next week for Ocean Literacy Principle number four. So we will see you here next Thursday at four.